Welcome back to our series titled Sarah's Daughters. And it's all about rediscovering your dignity, your destiny, and dynasty through the power of family. And so we want to talk today about um, primary relationship because we're working our way down the hierarchy of authority. So what we want to do is look at the relationship of a father to a daughter. When God created that relationship, what did he have in mind? What was his purpose that a father should bestow to a daughter? And so that's uh, the content of this session. And um, let's just think about for a moment family. And remember last session I, I mentioned um, the parallel between that we are created in the image of the divine, not only on a personal level as an individual, in that we are uh, soul, spirit, and body, the trifecta of the Trinity, but also that we uh, see the imprint of the Trinity on the very family itself. Jesus himself referred to um, God, the Father, and he as his son. And so we see that relationship in Abba, we have our perfect father. And in Jesus, we find not only our savior, but also our brother, sibling, friend, uh, that role. And the Holy Spirit himself personifies all of the template for mothering because his roles are as comforter, advocate, birther, brooder, creator. And we, as we explore the holiness of family, what we really hope to recapture, not only the beautiful template that God made the family to be, but also rediscover ourselves as the sons and daughters of the living God. So it's time to reclaim Abba's blessing, the Father's blessing. It's time to get back what's really ours. And, and that's found in the family. The family is the Lord's creation for the matrix for blessing and for life. And our maximum potential and protection as women is found there. And so we need to honor this and embrace it. Um, the word of God says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The family is something that God has joined together. I want to say it this way and paraphrase it or add an addendum to it. What God has joined together only God can sever. And when we try to sever these holy bonds without um, spiritual authority behind us, they can, holy bonds can be severed, but they must have spiritual authority. And when we try to do it just willfully or in our natural flesh, what we end up doing is actually tearing ourselves apart. And so we need to honor and embrace the power of family. And we'll never be able to maximize this matrix of power unless we are understanding it from God's point of view. And so that was what our introduction was about. We were looking at the foundations of authority that help us understand the true nature of authority and power. So the problem of family. Okay, here it is. God has created each of us with unique potentials, um, but he placed us in families we had no choice about or no say in. Because, and I, I mentioned before, this is where it gets interesting, because when we try to fight against what God has joined together, instead of working with it, we drain the power and vitality out of our own lives. We're not going to win that battle but we essentially tear ourselves apart. And so maybe instead of fighting God, fighting the family, fighting the place that we've come from, maybe we need to take a step back and begin to ask the right kind of questions. Maybe we need a different attitude. Maybe the key lies in finding answers to these questions. Why did you place me in this family, Lord? What are the giftings and anointing that you've given to my genetic lines? How do I fit into the big picture of your blessing over this family? Lord, what is my destiny specifically? And how do I work with the nuclear relationships of family and or marriage? Excuse me. 
oh, oh, excuse me, in order to maximize these. What is the role of a woman in the life of her mother, her father, her sister, brother, son, daughter, and her Lord? And add husband in there too. How, by recapturing righteous relationships, can I augment the effectual fruitfulness of my own life? And uh, we also talked last time about the fact that the word Sarah, which typically is translated like really daintily as princess, actually is the feminine of the root word Sar, which means chieftain, captain, ruler, to be or act as a prince or to bear rule, a fierce warrior. Don't kid yourself. Sarah is fierce. And Sarah and being her daughter is all about reclaiming the authority of the feminine that's been given to us from God within the matrix of the family and marriage and effectually using it powerfully, justly to better the world around us. It's the ability to reclaim our own destiny of our life and fulfill our true potential. And don't be fooled by the passage of time, because this old girl, Sarah, has plenty to teach a modern generation. And, you know, when God brags about you, then you can be boastful. But until then, you might want to pay attention to some of the things that we can learn from Sarah. If Sarah is the mother of our faith, then let's tap back into the mother load. So first of all, let's just begin by orienting ourselves again to our main teaching verse. And that's found in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. And I'm reading it out of the Amplified, so it's going to be wordy, but it helps us capture uh, some of the idea and intent behind it. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate, not as inferior, but out of respect for the responsibilities entrusted to husbands and their accountability to God, and so partnering with them, so that even if some do not obey the word of God, they may be won over to Christ without discussion by the godly lives of their wives when they see your modest and respectful behavior together with your devotion, appreciation, loving your husband, encouraging him, and enjoying him as a blessing from God. That's in parentheses. Your ornament must not be merely external, with interweaving and elaborate nodding of the hair, wearing of gold jewelry, or being superficially preoccupied with dressing in expensive clothes. But let it be the inner beauty of the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, at one that is so calm, self-controlled, not over-anxious, but serene and spiritually mature. This is very precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands and adapting themselves to them, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, following and having regard for him as head of their house, calling him Lord. And you have become her daughters, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear, that is, being respectful towards your husband, but not giving in to intimidation, or allowing yourself to be led into sin, nor to be harmed. And that is a very, very meaty chunk of scripture for, for us girls, but uh, it gives us plenty of direction and plenty to think about within the protocol of the family. So we're going to be delving into that. We're going to use this as a touchstone for the entire series. So let's just take a look at fathering. And I'm going to look at wonderful case studies from Scripture. And we're, as we consider these different dynamic relationships of the family, I'm not going to be expounding to you or be viewing them from a sociological or even a psychological perspective, because I'm not trained for that, nor am I even interested in that kind of perspective. I leave that to the scientifically able among you. Instead, what we're going to be doing is going deep into biblical stories which set a precedent and reveal profound 
insights into the nature of these relationships. And I, I did touch on some of these stories in my previous book and the previous series, Return to Eden. I made a reference to Caleb and to his interaction with his daughter, Asha, and that's found in Joshua 15. And I want to draw your attention specifically to the verses 13 to 19, Caleb and Asha. And if you remember, Caleb was uh, one of the 12 spies that Joshua sent out. And Caleb was one of two who came back and said, guys, we can do it. And the, the Lord said Caleb had a different spirit. And Caleb was a fighter. He was feisty. And he had a daughter who was a chip off the old block. And her name was Asha. And in, in this storyline, what is happening is that Caleb is marrying off his strong-willed daughter uh, to a man who happens to be her cousin. And he gets this, he takes Asha's hand in marriage as a reward for a victory in taking Hebron. And there are several factors in Caleb's behavior and attitude and treatment of Asha that recommend him as a good father. So I just would encourage you to reread that story. It's Joshua 15, 13 to 19, because I'm not going to read it all. Um, we, we see how that story happened. But after she's married, this is where we come into the story. Um, there's a second equally interesting part in this little father-daughter saga. And it has to do with springs. And we can see by the tenor of their exchange with each other that the two were well used to dealing with each other's strengths. And one day Caleb's out in the field and all from a distance he can see Asha coming and she's driving that little donkey at a fierce pace and he knows <laughs> she's a long way off but he can tell, uh oh, she wants something. And you can tell it by his opening words to her because he says, what wouldst thou in good King James in verse 18? And he, he's bracing himself for something. He knows her too well to think that this is just kind of some sweet little social visit. And she gives him a very bold reply. And it gives us insight into the level of their relationship between them. And so she says, give me a blessing. Since you've given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. And she's very bold with him. And um, there's something about this exchange that's rather charming. It is a father's job to ensure the future of his daughter by finding a suitable marriage mate for her. Uh, that's down about ninth in the list of things that the father needs to do for his daughter, but it's by no means um, in diminishing order of importance. And while this may not translate as directly as it did back in the days of Joshua and Asha, um, fathers do still play a very critical role in their daughter's lives. And in fact, if a father treats his daughter in the way God has ordained, a lot of future problems for potential abuse are removed for a woman from the lessons her father teaches her about honorable male behaviors. That's his job, to teach her about godliness and to teach her about godly male behaviors. And with faithfulness and honor and covenant um, loving kindness, what he actually does is build the level of her self-esteem. And obviously we can see this in the Joshua story, because if there's one thing Asha had, it was lots of self-esteem. So by modeling this responsible, nurturing, tender behavior, a man will set up an appropriate level uh, of his daughter's expectation in a mate. The higher her self-esteem is, the better, the higher the quality of man that she is going to expect to be meeting that. And um, her self-esteem is very important in this equation. And at ver psychologists do tell us that at various different junctures in a girl, teen, and young woman's life, a father 
um, affirms her sexuality, affirms her importance and her value. And um, he is the mirror through which she sees herself. And uh, he teaches her, the father teaches her how to be both sweetly surrendered to authority, but how to stand up for herself also quietly but surely as she navigates strange new rhythms of romance and courtship. And later, it serves her well in negotiating perilous waters of gender issues and ch childbearing in marriage and in parenting. A responsible father also provides a continuously silent, looming shadow of protection to a woman, even as she enters marriage and is in marriage. Knowing that she has the backing of her parents and their ongoing support really is invaluable covering to her at every stage of her life. Her interaction with her father shapes the framework, in fact, of her interaction in faith with Abba himself. A father is critical to a woman, critical to a daughter. And Abba, our heavenly father, has ordained that women should never be without a covering at any point in our lives. If you do a study of the Old Testament, what you will find is that a woman was always under co the covering of a man all the way through her life to be provider and protector for her. It started off in her father's house. When she got married, she was covered by her husband. If her husband died, there was provision made that she was married to another brother of her husband's family, a Leverite marriage, so that she always had a son, she always had provision, she always had protection, it, or if she was a widow and her son was old enough, her son provided for her. But there never was any point that a woman was uncovered. And in fact, it, if she had neither son nor husband, her father-in-law could also step into that role. And um, it, it is, we, we see that kind of role in Genesis 38 in the story of Tamar and uh, Judah. And if you have time, read that story because he treats her terribly. But the Lord looks after her all the way through the story, even though she shunned uh, her husband, original husband under Ju Judah's son dies. The second son he gives her uh, won't um, ejaculate inside of her so that she gets impregnated. The third son uh, he also d dies too. He treats her badly. And so she waits for the youngest son. But when the youngest son is of age, she's not given to him. And so finally, she takes matters into her own hands in what I believe was an anointed strategy and uh, hides as a prostitute along the road. And Judah himself impregnates her and she wins twins out of the equation and out of the whole story. And interestingly enough, there's a principle that arises out of this, and we see it also repeated in Genesis 31 in the story of Laban and Jacob. Because if a father refuses to give what rightfully belongs to his daughter, the Lord will eventually take what is his and actually give it to her. And we see that in Genesis 31.1, even Laban's sons realize that despite the fact Laban's been robbing Jacob all the way along and the appalling way he's been treated, God has somehow transferred the wealth and the honor of Laban into the house of Jacob and, of course, his, his wives, which are Laban's daughters. The Lord has a totally inscrutable and breathtaking way to level the playing field and restore equity on every front. And so um, it's interesting to look at this and uh, realize what God has done with these things. And as, I, and as we look at this, even mention the story of Laban. I want to just take a little side story here and talk about the nature of power. Because quite often, women will deal with unscrupulous men, whether or not they are fathers, husbands, brothers, bosses, even pastors. And we can go through a long season of great injustice and think that God is completely ignoring us. He doesn't care how used and abused the girls are. But in fact, that is not true. And 
as I was myself navigating uh, a season of very high provocation, I was dealing with an absolute total rogue of an unscrupulous man in authority over me. I cried out to the Lord for help and for wisdom. And amazingly, the word he gave me as a countermanding strategy was found in Proverbs 11.16. And it says this, Proverbs 11.16, A gracious woman retains honor, as ruthless, violent men retain riches. Well, I certainly scratched my head over that one when I got it. I was like, this is going to solve the problem, Lord? And... It's interesting because in the Hebrew, the word that is used for ruthless men is the word aritz, and it carries the meaning of about as strong and tough as you can get it. Ruthless, violent, strong, oppressive, tyrannical men striking terror. And I don't know how it strikes you, but it hit me that grace and honor seem to be highly inferior weaponry against this kind of nasty horde of male power. Now, gr given that men have been divinely granted both spiritual authority over women and physical superiority over women, it would seem like pursuing any form of equality or justice would be highly useless and frustrating, and a few of us have run into that. But part of the problem of looking for justice and looking for power and strength is that we're looking for it in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. What the Lord taught me through Proverbs 16, 11, 16, was really radical. And it was simply this, that simple dignity, virtue, and beauty in a woman are her most powerful armor against a hostile world. What? Read that again. Simple dignity, virtue, and beauty in a woman are her most powerful armor against a hostile world. Okay, how can this be? Sounds absurd. So in order to understand it, you need to grasp a simple but revolutionary truth again. And here it is. Brace yourself. All true power is moral power. All true power is moral power. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's go to scripture. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's a big chunk of very heavy-duty Greek words right there. But Peter is capturing for us an essential truth that he has learned about the entire realm of power and how to tap into it. Remember, our writer is a first-hand witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ himself. So he's got a lot to say about power, and what he says is this, all true power is moral power. It really has nothing to do with being male or female. The essence of the problem, the way to tap into power, is really submission. Let me explain. All power comes from God. God is love. God is power. All power comes from God. And it not only comes from him, it's going to return to him. And there are basically three realms of power. First of all, physical power, which is, occurs in the earth, which is natural, soulish, and, and um, that which is controlled by the physical laws of nature and physics. Secondly, spiritual power, which belongs to the spirit realm. And of the spirit realm, there are two different realms. The Holy Spirit, which is holy power and divine power from God, or the power of the occult. And the occult power is spiritual power, of course, but it's power res 
retained by these fallen spiritual creatures, angels that turned to demons when Lucifer fell. And although at times it may seem to you that like I'm sounding like an outdated hostess manual from the 1950s, I, as women, we must grasp the essential nature of authority and power in order to truly prosper. Otherwise, we're going to destroy ourselves in the process. And for women, this kind of moral power, the way Jesus manifests through the feminine is a little bit different than how he manifests through the masculine, although both forms of power originate in Christ. Um, honor and power for women manifest most potently in the area of virtue. And that is uh, goodliness, kindliness, sexual purity is a key element, and graciousness of comportment. And that's what our uh, Proverbs 11 scripture is talking about. This is really the gentle and quiet spirit that Peter once again talks about in our first Peter Touchstone passage. Most of our trouble as women actually stems from the fact that we gave away either our virtue or our honor, respect, and veneration for ourselves at some point. A man cannot take moral power from a woman. Only the woman herself can relinquish her honor to a man. For most women, the problem comes when we take the trust and adoration that we should be giving to the Lord and we lavish it on some man instead. And he becomes the delight and desire of our eyes and we squander our bodies, our love, our worship, which is really our power, on some creature who is unworthy or unready for it. An unredeemed man, the fallen nature of man, is always happy to lay hands on the body and beauty of a woman. They are content to seduce it for their pleasure and to their control without necessarily reciprocating the love and honor through the bonds of marriage, through the act of marriage, or faithfulness that the, a woman desires. And what, what a woman surrenders herself to is ba basically the description of the curse found in Genesis 3.16. But hallelujah, the curse is broken and we're not constrained by these conditions unless we choose them ourselves by our own actions and decisions. And you know, it's not my intent to badmouth the whole male sex here, but let's, let's talk turkey. Unless a woman has given the Lord her first love, her first priority of attention, love and romance can be a minefield that leave us emotionally devastated, physically wounded, and utterly shattered in identity. In our great vulnerability, it is essential for a woman to have a foundation of faith laid down in her life, trusting God to bring the right man into it. And this faith foundation I'm talking about is based and rests upon the submission to authority. I go into all this detail to make this one point clear. Women of God, do not be frustrated or fooled by the power, quote unquote, a man or any other authority figure may seem to have over you. Unless a man forcibly beats, murders, or rapes, he cannot divest you of your honor, and even then, in the eyes of God, he hasn't really taken it because you're an unwilling and innocent victim. But when we abandon ourselves, our reputation, and our vindication to the Lord, he will see both honor and power restored to us, just like he did in the story of Tamar and uh, uh, Judah, just like he did in the story of Jacob and Laban, and countless, countless, countless other stories in the Bible where he picks the victim up and restores them back into the place they deserve. And once a woman believes in and calls on the name of Jesus, he becomes the most powerful person in the equation of their lives, in the equation of all their relationships. He is the kinsman redeemer who will, destroy, uh, will restore 
what's been destroyed or stolen. And so when, when we talk about this issue of fathering, we need to consider the case of the worst biblical father ever. No, he was not only the worst biblical father-in-law, he was definitely the worst biblical father. And found in Genesis 29, of course, I'm talking about Laban. And we're given a clue to the driving motivation of this man's life. Uh, in Genesis 24, and it's the story of when Abraham's servant comes looking for a wife for Isaac. And uh, Laban was a younger man. He was all oily charm. As soon as he laid his eyes on all the rich ornaments the servant had bestowed on Rebekah, and when he saw the wealth of the entire entourage, he was like, oh, come, come, we got room for the camels, we got everything. Uh, fortunately, this servant had the wisdom to get Rebecca's consent and get out of there quickly. because. But Jacob was not so fortunate. Laban was a man with an inordinate desire for wealth and a, a complete package of unscrupulousness that was required that he needed to go after in any way he could. So not is he content with the fact that he's made a stunningly excellent love connection for his daughter with a relative of his line, which he knows. And not only does he, he's not content to be thrilled for her joy and her future secured, he proceeds through trickery and greed to make the lives of three people, who all of who are his kin, his blood, uh, two who are his own daughters, thoroughly miserable. He did not consider or prioritize the happiness of either Leah or Rachel when he deceived Jacob at the altar. And I'm absolutely certain neither girl was consenting willingly to this wretched plan. Rachel had no intention of sharing uh, Jacob, and Leah probably had her eye on somebody else entirely. But Laban saw his daughters only as a bargaining chip to get what he wanted and to keep the resources and labor of Jacob close to him. You know, there's an interesting passage in Leviticus 19.29 where the Lord forbids any man from selling his daughter into prostitution. But what Laban did in selling off of his off his daughters for this kind of personal advantage rates a close second. It is condemned by scripture. Again and again, he, it tells us he cheated Jacob, changed his wages 10 times, and finally the Lord intervened and restored Jacob his reward and pulled him out of there. And no one ever set a poorer example for fatherhood or father-in-lawhood than this manipulative and unprincipled man. Instead of setting them up in, in their own households to thrive and enjoy marriage, he initiated a bitter competition. Between them, it lasted their whole lives. Instead of offering encouragement and allowing them to become strong, independent women of God, he kept them close by his binding demand on Jacob, and he used them as pawns in his personal chessboard. Instead of laying up supply and blessing for their inheritance, as Proverbs tells us it is rightful for fathers to do for the children, he actually robbed them through his treatment of Jacob. He not only cheated Jacob, he cheated his daughters as well to make himself rich. And a fact they completely, uh, freely complain of in verses 14 to 16. They were very happy to leave their father behind even to the point of stealing the family teraphim in an act of covert contempt. But let's not end there. Because there's a wonderful example of fathering, and it's found in Job. Standing in brilliant contrast to Laban's selfish craftiness is the wonderful fathering of Job. Job stands as uh, quite a paragon of virtue in any number of categories, but he isn't often recognized as an unusually progressive father. So I'd like to rectify that today. The Lord himself brags on Job and lists his stellar qualities. He describes him as blameless, morally innocent, full of integrity, sound, wholesome, and a thoroughly straight arrow, conscientious, straightforward, and utterly fair. That's the meaning of the Hebrew word tamam, which is used to describe Job. Firstly, 
What an example of righteousness he must have been to his children. And then the Lord commends him as one that turns away and eschews evil. So not only was he a pious man, but he was also a bit of a social crusader. And we see that echoed uh, in his words in the 31st chapter. This is the example he's setting for his children. And from the sound of it, they were learning the lesson. The book opens with a singular glimpse into what sounds like a truly harmonious family life. Uh, the sons of Job were taking turns, feasting, inviting their sisters' families over. It was just a celebration of really authentic unity. And secondly, we can see the joy between the siblings. When you find joy between the brothers and sisters, you can be sure that the parenting is exemplary. It's, a, it's an outstanding mark of uh, good fathering and mothering. How men treat women is something they learn from watching the significant male roles in role models in their life. It cannot be faked. And thirdly, and finally, on what must have been the worst day of his life, the day of calamity and the news of the killing of his children and everything that happens, Job holds on to his cool spirit and his pious attitude. In the face of crippling grief and the bitterness of his son's demise, he retains his hold on the truth. And you know, children are really highly attuned to the response of their parents in the face of difficult storms and trials. Children are acutely sensitive to emotional climates and pick up quickly on attitudes and actions. So his measured response must have brought great calm to his family. It certainly didn't achieve the destruction that Satan was looking for or he wouldn't have gone for round two. Job had to be doing some things very, very right to draw the kind of fire he did. And even through the dark and difficult days that followed, even in his perplexity and his open lament, he does not abandon his integrity. He is exposed and he is deeply tormented, but he's not afraid to ask the hard questions, to even wail out loud. He's not ashamed of his own emotion. This is not taught very much. But children actually learn a lot from their parents' ability to grapple with their own weakness and vulnerability in suffering through difficult times. Children are watching closely. It may shatter our childish hero worship a bit, but as adults, the examples that our parents set for us in times of trouble are going to be our future anchors. And fourthly, as Job comes through this terrible storm of faith, we see the final example of his excellent fathering, especially towards his daughters. Because this was an age, remember, when women were for the most part sequestered and silenced. But Job's daughters became legendary through the land for their beauty and gracious comportment. And they're actually named in scripture, which is highly significant in the face of the fact that the son's names are never named. But you get the strong sense from this verse, Job 42:15, and his previous exchange with his bold wife in chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, that he was mighty progressive in his attitude to the feminine for a man of his time and culture. And he is credited finally with the unusual ac action of giving his daughters an equal inheritance along with the sons, which was completely unheard of in that day. Uh, we're, let's just look at one final situation before we close our teaching on the role of a father. And I want to look at an interesting story in Numbers 26 because it asks and answers the question, what do you do, daughter? What do you do, woman, when you have no father? And it's the story of the daughters of Zelophehad. And uh, what's happening is Joshua and uh, Israel have come into the promised land, and they're in the middle of setting the promise, settling the promised land and dividing it out to the tribes. And we, we, Let's let our lens zoom in at ground level. And there's a family. And, of course, the a whole Numbers 26 is a list of 
families and numbering and tribal allotments as they come into their inheritance. But way down at ground level in the tribe of Joseph, there's a man called Zahalaphan, and they've got a bit of a family problem. Because when the division of the territories came, there was a conundrum. This poor man had died in the wilderness on the journey, and he had born to him five daughters and no sons. And, you know, property rights in ancient Israel were always inherited down through the sons. The girls inherited the dowry, but really they were left high and dry when it came to land. And so these girls, in the middle of the coming out of the wilderness, going into the promised land, they had no home, they had no prospects, they had no dowry. And in fact, the name of their father was in danger of perishing among the tribe in the land. And so, you know, you can wonder why their father didn't take care of them before he died. He had five of them, you know, hello, make some preparations, but apparently this was just to leave us with some kind of a spiritual precedent. So what happens is the girls rise up and they take the matter before Moses, who brings it to the Lord. And this is one of my favorite stories. I just happen to love it because it's one of the handful of places in the scripture where the Lord directly intervenes for the girls. And we can clearly see the heart of Abba. He says this, uh, Numbers 27, um, 7. The daughters of Zahalaphad speak rightly. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brethren. You shall cause the inheritance of the father to pass to them. And the Lord overthrows traditional uh, cultural mores of inheritance. And he makes sure that the girls do get something. And in fact, a new precedent is set before the law, uh, into the law of Moses. So these women are definitely provided for. And um, we find that they have to marry within their own tribe so that the land stays in the proper tribe. But notice how the Lord keeps them under covering. Now, although they don't have the covering of the man, they, now they have the covering of the tribe because the tribe has a vested interest in marrying these girls off and keeping them in the tribe because they have land. It now becomes highly advantageous to marry a daughter of Zaholophag. And I bring this story into this chapter because we need to capture a key principle. Even when the actual father is no longer present to defend what belongs to his offspring, Abba steps into the gap. And whatever the case, your heavenly father has a plan to furnish to you what was lost, forfeited, stolen, broken, given away. He's the redeemer and his girls are not forgotten. If you were a woman of faith, you were never without covering and protection, no matter what your circumstances are. Psalm 27:10 says, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. And we see also um, that there's a extended fathering role. I've mentioned it briefly in the life of uh, the, a father-in-law, but also the principles of fathering pertain to leaders in the church, pastors, deacons, elders, also carry through the job of the fathering, especially to widowed or single women in the church. So and just to sum up, the job of a father, according to God's eyes, is to actually physically beget, nourish, nurture, protect, and provide for his children. It is also to provide uh, not only physical protection and, and physical food, but spiritual protection and food and education for godly development. He is to showcase the wisdom of God in his words and in his actions, and he is to teach his children, male and female, about the truth of moral power, that all real power comes from doing what is right according to the virtue of Christ, not from being male or from being female, but from being righteous. Uh, it is His job is to train up a child in discipline and honor so that their identity and their value are reinforced and they develop their particular giftings, uh, especially as a woman. It is to affirm a woman's identity and her value at different stages in her life, to protect her from all predators who would exploit her beauty, her virtue, or her sexuality, especially 
as she comes into puberty and as she comes into marriageable age. It is to provide a godly male example for women so that they know what to look for in a mate. And it is finally to be the shadow of wisdom, security, and protection to a daughter all the days of her life, married or unmarried. This is the role of a father. And it's a very powerful role. It is also a very um, role potentially rife for abuse. And there has been much abuse in it. But when we look at what God intended through the family, and especially through the father, who is the highest point in the hierarchy, power, we see that not only is there a high level of authority, but there's an extremely high corresponding level of responsibility. Men need God's help every day to be good fathers. And it's our job to pray for them so that they get it. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Abba. You are the father of all the tribes of the earth. And Lord, help us in the ways, even as there are people listening to this right now who have not received good fathering and they've been wounded, crippled, and um, their lives have been corrupted because of it. Lord, I speak and release restoration over those areas because you are El Shaddai. When all is said and done, you're the great parent. And Father, I just ask for wisdom right now um, to help us deal with our fathers alive or dead, you know, in our own memory, in our own spirit, to release them and forgive them for things they have done or did not do. And Lord, if they're still alive, to support them, to uphold them, and to just love on them in the way that you've ordained. We thank you, Father, for all of this in Jesus' name. Now let's just close with our questions, of course, from the conclave. Father to daughter, when you think about your family situation right now, is it generally positive or negative? Is it more burden or blessing? What are some of the giftings or anointings that run through your family lines? Can you see them clearly? In light of these, what do I consider the personal ministry mandate of my own life, i.e., what's my mission from God? Looking at Sarah, what do you consider the smartest thing she ever did? Where do you consider to her to have taken a victim stance? What do you most admire about Sarah? What did you learn about men from your father, which was both positive and negative? How has this affected you? What are you lacking that you should have gotten from your father? In our Proverbs 11.16 passage, a gracious woman retains honor, as ruthless men retain riches. When you consider this, what comes to your mind? What's your personal experience in this area? Who do you think is the best father, besides Abba, of course, in the Bible? Why do you wish, what do you wish for in some of his fathering? 